Today's service was created by our own Sue Reinhardt, and she brings many gifts to our congregation, but I'm going to share with you the ones that particularly relate to her topic today, which is the five lessons from shamanism. Sue completed programs in healing and earth philosophy with Tom Brown Jr., who was mentored for 10 years in his youth by a 90-year-old Apache holy man and healer. And I'm sure some of you have read some of Tom Brown's books that document that experience of his. She has certificates in earth philosophy and healing from Earth Skills, a school out of Fraser Park. In Santa Barbara, she hiked every week for 10 years with Dr. David Cumes, local surgeon and practicing Sangoma, who was initiated among the Venda and Zulu in South Africa. In 2007, Sue traveled to South Africa for six weeks and met with indigenous healers in their homes and experienced the work firsthand at the source. In 2017, she published an important reference book on the medicinal uses of local flora, which a lot of you have familiarity with that book. I'm not done. <laughs> Sue studied massage at Body Therapy Institute for four years, where there is a heavy emphasis on traditional Chinese medicine. She is a veteran of five solo vision quests, which changed her life. Sue, <laughs> thank you so much for being willing to share this wonderful experience with us today. I'm so excited about hearing everything that you Today's meditation will be a guided meditation, and I'd like you to close your eyes. Please be comfortable and settle, going deeper with each of your next three breaths. Now fly upon the wings of your breath to one of the pristine natural scenes you imagined as we sang the first song. When you arrive, take a seat somewhere with a nice view. Look upon this scene with your eyes there ancient eyes, the eyes of early people. This means observing it with wide angle vision, noticing all that nature is doing without focusing on any one thing. Stay in wide angle vision, but begin to notice the shining mist forming out in front of you. Stay in wide angle vision. A friendly entity is beginning to take shape in the mist. Stay in wide angle vision as it steps forward from the mist and begins to come towards you. It is carrying something. When it arrives right in front of you, it offers that thing to you. You may accept the gift and place it in your heart where you can tend it. Now you can look into the eyes of this messenger from the spirit world and thank it. Return to wide angle vision. Notice the messenger going back into the mist, turning and waving at you. But notice everything else as well as the mist begins to dissolve.
staying in wide angle vision, again, fly upon the wings of your breath back to our sanctuary. Keep your eyes closed. See our sanctuary and your friends here shining on the backs of your eyelids. Finally, open your eyes and with one breath, you are fully back. Everybody back. I have been obsessed with healing since I started getting migraines when I was nine years old. My whole lifetime of interests around this helped me and led me into a 25 year study of shamanism, which is highly psychological, partly herbal, and partly spiritual. I confess that it has been a struggle to make these ideas intellectually respectable to myself, and that's important to me. Fortunately, my mentors and friends understand it in modern terms, And I am also grateful that two of them required that I learn some of the survival skills of living in the earth on the, with the old ways to keep me grounded and to keep me in touch with native ancient people. In any case, there is no see to believe with shamanism. There is only believe to see. Here is an example of modern shamanic divination from about 2006. As many of you know, I rent out space in my house to make ends meet. And at the time, I was living in two of the bedrooms that had a separate entrance and renting out the whole rest of the house. Now, the space had been empty for 10 weeks and I was out of money and scared. So I decided to consult my new shaman friend who had sought me out to teach him the medicinal plants, to have him throw the bones about my vacancy. <clears throat> In South Africa, where my friend was initiated, shamanic divination is done with symbolic animal bones and other objects that can be ritually poured out from a little bag onto a reed mat. The understanding is that an ancestral spirit of the shaman, or sangoma as they are called, controls how the bones fall and also assists in the interpretation. Also, for the sake of this story, you need to know that in South Africa, they frequently visualize the ancestral spirits as bees. So the day came for my appointment and we sat on the floor in the ndumba that he had in his backyard and the bag of bones was ritually emptied onto the mat. Using a long porcupine pit quill, he pointed out things about how the objects had fallen. And the final diagnosis was the obvious fact that the word of my rental had not gotten to the right person. <laughs> but he gave me homework, and I was committed to do it. First, I was to gather some things, four specific leaves, honey on a comb, an abalone shell, and matches. Then I was to hike up to Gaviota Peak. That's a long hike, by the way. Um, and it has a 360 degree view. There I was to burn the four leaves to ash in the shell, mix honey into the ashes, and then dab the mixture on stones I would find there at each of the four directions. 
All the while, I should be asking the ancestors to carry the news of my rental to the right person. I did the long hike in the ritual, and I was glad nobody was around to watch on that hot Tuesday. I was self-conscious. When I turned to the trail again after the ritual, I noticed that there was this little purple sage plant about that high. And as I walked by it to go back to my car, a huge black bumblebee flew straight out of it and whapped against the side of my leg. And then it sort of shook itself and flew off to the northwest. Okay. <laughs> um, two hours later, when I got to my car, I opened the glove box to get my phone and check if I had messages, and it rang in my hand. It was a woman from Los Alamos. She was all breathless. A friend of hers in Santa Barbara had just seen my news press ad from two Sundays before and had just given her a call on the off chance the place was still available. Now this lady's house had been sold and she had only two weeks left till close of escrow and she had to move with her two little daughters and her cat. So they came to see the place that evening and in a few minutes, I had cash in my hand and they were great tenants for seven years. Through years of workshop and traveling to Africa, long friendships with shamans, healers, Jungian psychologists, and teachers of earth-based philosophy and skills, I have learned some of shamanism's secrets. I'm told I've been a victim of its dark side. I understand it in modern terms, and I have its experienced its rather considerable power. Not just the mental issue either. So what is shamanism then? Why is it important? And how does it work? The word shaman re actually in technically re refers only to the ritual healers of areas around Mongolia who work in deep trance. But because of certain books, the term shamanism has popularly come to include thousands of highly local, spirit-based ritual healing practices found the world over, both past and present, whether done in trance or not. However, it should be kept in mind that most indigenous groups, including the Shumash, would be offended if you called their healer or holy person a shaman. They have their own terms of respect for such a person. But today I will use the term in the broadest possible sense as a shorthand to explore what these varied culture specific practices share. Shamanism is not a religion. It is a healing practice that has been going on since the dawn of man. It has been practiced since before cultures began inventing gods in their own images. It is the primeval psycho-spiritual healing technology of mankind. Now it is rooted deep in our collective unconscious and we are pre-programmed to respond to it. Shamanism is a power practice based on the animistic worldview. The quest for the gift of healing is not all sweetness and light and altruism. It is indeed a quest for power. Animism, not to be confused with spiritualism, is the idea that each thing, even a stone, is alive and ensouled, has spirit. Spirit which can be envisioned in many creative ways. In Africa and parts of Asia, it's all about ancestors. 
In the Americas, it's more about animal spirits and earth spirits. The re this respectful point of view gives rise to a rich and sustainable way of living. Let me turn the page here. Each local subculture has its own entities and ways of conducting ceremony to mo be most effective Shamanic work must be done in a cultural context that is relative to the people at hand. Spirits are typically envisioned as interacting in a parallel world beyond the veil of ordinary consciousness. It is a realm whose denizens must be honored, tended, and feared. A shaman is someone who can interact in that world of spirit for those who cannot do it for themselves. There are many helpful spirits and healing shamans. There are also hateful and discordant shamans and dark spirits, as well as a huge gray area. It is a balanced power. The same techniques are used for both kinds of work. The difference has to do with the intent and the emotion that motivates and empowers the rituals. Shamans view illness in terms of problems with spirit, possession, intrusions, breaches of taboo, malevolent practices, and soul loss, for example. Hollywood knows all about this. Medicine and psychology have modern terms for these conditions, but research shows that certain forms of mental illness do actually heal better for some patients if shamanic rituals like exorcism are part of their treatment. The more dramatic the problem, the more intense the ritual must be to heal it. You have no doubt heard that a shaman is a master of ecstasy. In my view, a better word would be intensity. But because of this, people have come to associate shamanism with the use of psychedelics. And yes, indeed, psychedelic sacred substances have been used as a means to induce trance to enable the shaman's work. More often though, being alone in nature for long periods, fasting, drumming, clapping, dancing, singing, and creative work are used instead. The modern shamans I know have cultivated their meditation and sensitivity skills to enable them to, to achieve a proper state for the work while still being able to function normally. As was pictured in the first slide, the sand bushmen of Botswana dance all night around the fire until a few of them collapse into unconscious trance, out cold, which transforms them into healers for the evening. No substances are used, just the dance and the syncopated clapping of the community sitting in a circle around them. When questioned afterwards, the healers say either that they climbed a rope of light or that their body elongated until their head reached the realm of the ancestors. While there, the beloved dead gave them the power of healing for one or more people in the circle. They slowly returned to consciousness, shaking convulsively. And as soon as they can walk, they go over and put their vibrating hands on the person needing healing, who often recovers. No one does something for 30,000 years unless it works some of the time. In South Africa, Sangomas use drumming to become temporarily possessed by a spirit an ancestral spirit that has something to say to the client. The Sangoma may exhibit surprising behavior, including the ability to speak fluently 
and even in the same voice as the ancestor in question. And these are languages that only the client understands. Languages that the Shangoma would have no way of knowing. The work may be dramatic with elaborate costumes, speaking in tongues, a chicken sitting quietly on someone's head and altered states. But it also may be simple, like counseling, where the shaman works one-on-one -on -one with someone, but is understood to be helped by spirit guides. Shamans also interpret dreams, both their own and those of the client, in a similar way to how they work with material from trance, including that they get specific information about which herbs and rituals to give from their dreams and, and trances. Creating and communicating, communicating is the key word here, an intense waking dream of a healed re reality is an important skill of a shaman. For example, one process of doing this is called envisioning, not to be confused with just visualization. It's much more intense. They're actually creating a vision. And it is done by first entering the spirit world through meditation or otherwise, and then in that space, intensely realizing and visualizing the desired outcome in vivid detail. The shaman sort of overlays this healed vision onto the client and transfers it through ritual rather than with words. It becomes a kind of picture prayer that communicates to spirit and reaches deep into the unconscious of the client. Getting back to ecstasy, where we started this section, uh, modern understandings would say that the techniques of shamanism are good at bringing up intense material from the unconscious. This is not always ecstatic and pleasant. It can even be completely overwhelming and terrible. In the end, though, such material is brilliantly compelling and fascinating for the person, whether of the light or even if it is of the shadow. It clamors persistently for balanced integration into the personality as part of the person's journey to wholeness. The urge to individuation is irresistible. It shines. Becoming whole is healing. Shamanism is alive and well today. The rituals and techniques thrive in many mainstream religions and are also coming more widely studied and even practiced by psychotherapists. So why is this important for us? I am interested in healing, but putting on a big show, not so much. The more ordinary te techniques of shamanism, such as intent, envisioning, touch, love, personal attention, listening, dream sharing, herbs, meditation, music, positive statements, and so on, are healing on their own. For me, the most compelling takeaways from this 25-year period of inquiry are in five categories spirit, balance, sacred space, ritual, and healing. In terms of spirit, you don't have to believe in spooks to understand this. If you don't like the word spirit, just use the word energy. What is spirit anyway, but the essential energy of someone or something? I have found that conducting my life while mindful of the essential nature, the flat out holiness of every single thing around me is profound. It makes life rich. Entering the spirit world is as simple as using your imagination while in a meditative state, envisioning, 
as we just did. Spirit is energy. Let your imagination flesh it out with pictures, songs, and stories. In the opening song, you probably used your imagination to see beautiful scenes. Just coming into our sanctuary and hearing the music had already put you into a light alpha state. Hopefully, the song got your imagination going. Then during the meditation, you went a step deeper and envisioned a spirit entity with a gift for you. Spending time alone outdoors is even better for putting you into an alpha state. You don't need to meditate in nature. Nature will meditate you. Some people know that. Early people lived outdoors all the time. This made everyone more open to spirit energies than we can understand. The veil really was thinner then. Now it's about being in nature with ancient eyes and using your imagination. Nature itself heals. And just because spirits can be viewed as something we imagine doesn't mean they're nothing. Imagination is the first step in human creativity. What we imagine does affect our health. For me, the most problematic teaching from shamanism were those about balanced. I was taught to be a good girl and behave myself, especially at church, and to reject anything with any shadow of evil about it. Rather, balance is a constant discipline requiring daily tending. Leonard Cohen wrote of balance, it all may be one in the higher eye, but down here where we live, it is two. Like shamanism, we too have a light and dark side. And we are also full of all kinds of other competing priorities. It is not that we should repress what seems negative. We don't have to put a value judgment on everything. Rather, we should be developing a system of reciprocal balance, a homeostasis, that lets us safely integrate all aspects of ourselves, even those we have pushed into the unconscious. We stay on track the way a gyroscope guides a rocket with constant small course corrections. We don't need to be perfect and good. We need to stay balanced and we need to be authentic. Working on the quilts and paintings I've been showing you in this talk was a tool that helped me with my own conflicting priorities. Making these mandalas, which were mostly inspired by the medicine wheel, were meditations that over time helped me learn to stay more centered. It is in the center that we are transformed. It is there that we can experience that sacred oneness Leonard Cohen spoke of, the oneness of the higher eye. The center is a shining sacred space where amazing things happen for us. Sacred space is a favorite concept of mine. Shamans set up sacred space to be a container for ritual. They do so in traditions I have studied by marking the four directions with symbolic colors, animals, and objects to define a protected area where a ceremony can unfold. Sometimes a circle is also drawn or symbols of the four or even five elements are used similarly. There is also an important understood connection with the skyward and earthward directions, again, with a balance point at the center. What interests me more, though, is how each of our lives unfolds in personal sacred space. We carry it around with us as a surrounding sphere, bejeweled with the four directions, the sky and the Earth's core. 
Now I lost my place. <laughs> uh, this is the medicine wheel you may have heard about, which is pictured on the back of your program if you want to use it in your personal practice. The medicine wheel grew out of the Native American pipe ceremony and is given physical form in the sweat lodge structure. Healing is at the center, right where each of us exists. The shaman's gift is in helping a person realize their center and take hold of the healing that is already there, the healer within. In meditation, personal ritual or creativity, we can bring about a marriage of our competing priorities right here, right now, sacred space everywhere. Closely connected with sacred space is ritual. It is a shaman's most powerful tool. Shamanic ritual should not be a performance for tourists. It is a private HIPAA protected three-way interaction between shaman, client, and community, and spirit. Ritual is embodied multi-sensory intention or, or enacted prayer. The elements of ritual are sacred space, clear intent, mindful actions, significant or symbolic actions, emotion, and a celebrant, all of which send a powerful nonverbal message of intent to spirit on behalf of the people at hand. To quote Tom Brown Jr., my first teacher, the spirit world knows no time or place, nor does it communicate to us in language. It speaks through dreams, visions, signs, symbols, intuition, and feelings. And we can communicate back to spirit to the very essence of things, including our own deepest selves. In the same way, it communicates with us, not with language, but with intent, envisioning symbols, actions, and feelings, all empowered by emotion. Ritual is a great way to do this. Even our simple chalice ritual is an example. We don't pray with words. Oh, please give us a chance to serve. Rather, we bring our collective light together to strengthen it as we ignite the chalice here in our sanctuary. At the end of the service, we extinguish it with a positive statement saying, as we extinguish our chalice, our service truly begins and we carry the light of our chalice into the world. Our worship leader has physically interacted with signs and symbols in a sacred place and time to visually embody with the chalice flame our intention that our personal and collective light be of service. Love is the emotion that makes it so. Our chalice flame makes a positive statement about what will happen going forward. This is effective ritual practice. In terms of healing, there is a difference between healing and curing. Curing is the wonder that living bodies miraculously recover from all kinds of terrible things with and without the help of modern medicine and other interventions. Healing, which is our topic here, on the other hand, is bringing a whole situation back into balance. Healing can always happen even at the moment of death. Shamanic healing can help with problems from spirit. Healing can reduce suffering Healing can give a positive perspective. Healing can enhance the effect of any medicine or herb up to 70%. Healing offers meaning. 
Healing can even activate a person's vital energy to a point where a cure or remission could happen. In the end, the important thing for us is that the ordinary techniques of shamanism can help anyone develop a more compassionate presence. With just a little mindful, more mindfulness and intent on our part, simple things like a sick day home from school, reading a bedtime story, cooking dinner, taking a walk, can become little healing rituals without doing anything differently on the surface or making anyone feel weird. To communicate with spirit only requires intent, designated space, meaningful objects and actions, and a mindful person in charge who empowers the ritual with love. In summary, I never felt comfortable with the idea of becoming a shaman. I didn't feel the need to take psychedelics, but I felt powerfully called by my own experience with migraines to do something about pain. I took a vision quest to find out how to manifest this. I was highly committed, but I was struggling to feed my family on a graphic artist's meager wage. When the opportunity arose, to teach medicinal plants in adult ed, it was a first step that didn't even require that I quit my job. The wisdom of a vision quest unfolds one step at a time over many years, and only if you do what has already been revealed. But then I started getting all these amazing dreams, wonderful insights, and wise teachers about healing. It didn't seem right to have so much inspiration coming in and no proper outlook for it, outlet for it. It took decades and five vision quests for me to unfold the original vision to do something about pain. It was only when I humbled myself and came to grips with the fact that there would be no magical gift of healing that is given to some people and not to others, that I realized I actually had to go and learn an acceptable modern skill, get some down-to-earth training, get a license to touch people. Not until age 60 did I start with four years of massage school followed by a very satisfying retirement career for 10 years until I just couldn't physically do it anymore. The more I learned about shamanism, the more I finally came to realize that my, by being mindful of shamanic principles like spirit, balance, sacred space, ordinary ritual, and healing makes a big difference. Bringing what I learned back to my massage clients redeemed a lifetime of pain. Sharing with you now continues the journey.